Hey, what's up guys? My name is Ichino. Welcome back to my game engine series. So last time we took a look at the input manager and we kind of made an input polling system. Definitely take a look um, at that video if you haven't already. And today we're going to kind of continue on with that and do something that I wanted to do for a while. And that is to actually create our own kind of Hazel key codes and mouse button codes, right? So this might be a problem that a lot of you don't realize we actually have. Um, but essentially what we're relying on right now is the GLFW API for the definitions of key codes. Now, the reason that that's a problem is because first of all, it ties us very heavily to GLFW. Second of all, it means that GLFW has to be known by the actual client, not just the engine. So what I mean by that is, let's just say you're inside your game or your application that uses Hazel, right? So you don't, you know, this isn't actually the Hazel library. This is your actual application, your client. And then you want to check to see if the space bar is pressed, right? Well, to do that at the moment, what you have to do is basically uh, write code. That's like input is key pressed GLFW key space or something, right? Something like that. We don't want to do that because that means that you actually have to have to include GLFW into your application. We don't want that We're, The only thing you should be including in, in your application really is, um, Hazel. Now, you know, there are other things that you will use. For example, you know, SPD log has to be included in some sense because we just have macros, which expand to kind of SPD log things. Um, then the other thing that you actually need to have included would be like, um, what was the other thing? Uh, I'm GUI, right? So I'm GUI is something that you would write kind of client side as well. But with things like, uh, GLFW, you know, we don't, we don't want to have any kind of relation to that. The reason that that's a problem as well is that, you know, I am GUI, that, that's going to be used on all platforms. SPD log is going to be used on all, on all platforms. GLFW though, might not always, we might not always use GLFW. So at the moment we're using it for Windows, Mac and Linux essentially, right? That's kind of the plan. But in the future, you know, it might, you might want to use the Win32 API and then like on Windows and then Mac Linux, maybe we'll just stick with GLFW for Mac and Linux. So immediately that creates a problem because everything's tied to GLFW. We don't even need GLFW on Windows. That's an issue. Now, the other big thing though, is that GLFW key codes are actually different than certain other key codes. For example, the Win32 API defines the key codes as actual different constants, right? Different integers, different values than GLFW does. So that's a problem because you know, if we, if we rely on GLFW and we switch to Win32 API, we can't keep using those same constants. We need some kind of, either some kind of conversion, like strategy or like some kind of like lookup table to kind of translate between the two, or maybe we need to change the original key codes on Windows. There's like a whole kind of mess that gets created. So that's kind of what we're going to address in this episode. We don't actually have to do much work today because um, we are kind of tied to GLFW, but all I want to do is, is just get rid of that GLFW dependency for our key codes and essentially set up a very simple system and also show you guys around the code a little bit um, as to what you what you will actually have to do um, and why this is a problem and all of that. So let's just jump into the code. I think I'm going to just stop talking for now. But let's jump into the code and we'll take a look at like the situation and what we can actually do about it. Okay, so to reiterate the problem right now, um, or rather the previous episode when we made this input class um, and we did all of that, we tested it out in application, which was great, right? So we had application run, we did input get mouse position, we got all of our stuff. That's great. Mouse position is an easy one. Now, if we actually do something like input um, is key pressed, we need, to we, need, we need to provide a key code. Now we are inside application, does EPP, which is inside Hazel. Um, I don't think we actually include GLFW here, um, but at the, at the minute, what we would actually have to do is something like GLFW key tab, right? That's a problem because we have to include GLFW to do that. Now, this problem is even worse if you take this and you decide, actually, I want to do this in our actual sandbox app. This is not in the Hazel project. This is inside the sandbox project, right? It's in a completely different place. Um, we definitely don't want to include GLFW here. This is our client, right? So, and yet if I want to do something like this, or maybe in the on update, I just want to see if this is pressed, right? So let's just do some code like the, if that's pressed, then, you know, we'll do something like edge that info tab key is pressed, right? That's our goal kind of for today. We want to be able to do something like this, but without including GLFW, how do we do that? 
Um, let me just make sure that we're in Hazel and I think we'll probably have to update hazel.h to include I'll, I'll always like forget to do this. I'll probably just do this as we go along. I don't want to sit there and write this whole thing out um, but you know We'll kind of have this in roughly alphabetical order. Um, we'll have input here and then you can see now well, this is the problem. So what we want to do instead is do something like age set key tab, right? So we're, we're kind of depending on Hazel key codes now instead of actually the GLW ones, which is fantastic because again, that means that we're eliminating that dependency to, to GLFW, but also making sure that no matter what library we end up using in the back end, we'll always have one kind of set of key codes that can be accessible and that's it. So to kind of further illustrate this problem a little bit, if we actually go to GLFW3.h, which is the header file, and we look at um, GLFW key tab, you know, here it is. We have a bunch of constants here, a um, bunch of defines. This is defined to be 258. That's great, right? 258, whatever. Here's the issue. If we look at the virtual key codes defined by Microsoft, right? So this is in the Win32 API. Look at this, tab over here is defined to be nine. Nine, okay? It's an hexadecimal, but it's the same in decimal. Nine, 258 and nine. Clearly they're different numbers, right? So we can't actually, they're not compatible with each other. So what we need to essentially do is choose one convention. We either do like this. We, we could obviously invent our own key codes as well, but that's not really, that's not, there's no real benefit to doing that. Um, we either pick like Microsoft's ones, we pick GLFW's ones, and we kind of just stick with that. And then if we're on a different platform, we could do some kind of conversion where necessary, either at compile time if we really wanted to, or even at runtime. So I'll show you how that works. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is actually steal this, okay? I don't really care about the unknown key, but all of these printable keys, um, where we kind of begin here, I'm just gonna copy and paste this entire block, okay? Um, and then I'm going to make a file uh, just in here uh, called keycodes.h, all right? And I'm just gonna paste all of this in here. Now, GLFW, I'm going to hit Control H um, and I don't know if you'll get, you guys will be able to see this. Um, maybe if I drag it over here, you'll definitely see it. I'm just gonna find and replace GLFW, like that, underscore, with HZ underscore. And then Alt A will replace it everywhere in this current document. And there we go. So now we've effectively stolen GLFW's key codes here. Um, now, again, we might want to redefine certain things. So for example, you know, they, they've like, I don't know, decimal divide, like maybe you're not happy with like some key codes, like this one's called super. This actually refers to the, to the Windows key, or if you're on Mac, the command key. Um, I don't know, some people don't like the name super. They think it's weird. They might ref like re rename it to Windows key. Obviously, I'm, I'm just gonna keep it as super because we do support more than just Windows. Um, and so we don't wanna tie anything to like be Windows key or whatever. Um, we have the uh, keypad stuff. Anyway, this looks pretty good to me. I'm obviously gonna add a comment from glfw3.h, okay? Just so that we know um, if we wanna update this or if we wanna to refer to this or somehow this has changed. Um, but that's the basic gist of, of it, right? I'm also going to add a new item, a header file here called mouse button codes. And then this will be, and then this will be kind of the same. Um, we'll go to glfw3, glfw mouse button, um, and then we'll just grab all of these. Uh, and there's a bunch of mods as well, which we could worry about. Um, they're just certain bits that are set. Um, they're for modifier flags by the actual GLFW functions. We're not gonna bother for now. If we do need them in the future, we will use them. Um, and then over here, I can just uh, quickly replace this to be HZ, um, and then same with here. Okay, and again, I'll add my little comment from GLFW3.h, and there we go, okay? Cool, so we have our mouse button codes and we have our key codes. These header files are really light as well, obviously, they're just defines, um, which is really nice. No functions here, no symbols really, just defines. Um, so that is quite good. Uh, and we have pretty much everything we need. Now, here's the thing, um, and what I'll do obviously is I'll go to that Hazel header file of mine and I'll include, you know, Hazel mouse button codes, Hazel key codes. Okay, might just put input into its own little section here like that. Okay, cool. So there we go. 
Um, we've got all of that stuff. Now, if we go to Sandbox app, obviously this works. And guess what? If we actually test this, it will work, right? So if I go into, into application, I'm just gonna get rid of um, this stuff that we talked about last time. I also don't really particularly want to log every event right now, so I'll just comment that out. Um, and hopefully I think we'll only have this left. So let's just see what this looks like. Okay, so here's our application. Um, this is our log. So we're still doing example layer update. But if I hit the tab key, you can see it says tab keys pressed. I might just um, get rid of that and maybe just make this trace so that it's not green. Okay, so we have this now, and if I hit the tab key, you can see it says tab keys pressed. Okay, I'm holding it down. So there we go, that now works and everything's fine. We've just kind of stolen GLW key codes and everything's fine. Now let's talk about conversions and where that might be necessary, where it won't be necessary, and what I even mean by that. So again, the problem here that we're trying to solve is potentially if we switch from GLW to Win32, these will be different, right? What I mean by that is at the moment, if you take a look at what's happening, we do is key pressed, right? We go to the Windows implementation of that, and then we look up GLW key, uh, get key. But what if we're doing the Win32 API version of this function, right? We need to provide a Win32 API key code, right? So here are your options and what you could essentially do. Um, the first thing you could do is probably the most efficient in terms of runtime cost. And that is to basically say that, well, hang on a minute. If we are on a certain platform and when we compile Hazel and its application on a certain platform for a certain target, we know what the actual like windowing library or whatever will be, right? We know if we're using GLFW, we know if we're using Win32 API, we know what we're doing. So what we could do is just based on the platform that we're compiling for, change these codes to be the correct ones for that given platform. So in other words, if we did go with the kind of uh, scenario that I came up with where, where we have Hazel on Mac and Linux using GLFW and Hazel on Windows using Win32 API, then when we compile, you know, we could have like a, you know, if def HZ platform Windows, we have Windows key codes. Otherwise, if it's HZ platform Mac OS or HZ platform Linux, we have GLFW key codes. What that means is that any runtime checks we do, this constant is actually different based on the platform we've compiled for, right? Um, so again, if it's Windows, this would be defined to be nine, if it's because nine is the one that we have here, right? Whereas um, Mac, or Linux, Mac or Linux, this would be 258. Now that's great. Um, you could do it that way. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way, I think. Um, that's one of your options and that's kind of the, what did I, I lost my, here it is, lost my Windows input. Um, that's one of the options, it's not bad. Um, the only problem with that that I can really see is that if you decide to somehow serialize that data or store it, um, it wouldn't really be compatible with, uh, you know, with the other kind of key code, I guess, values. Um, so for example, let's just say that I have a save file for my game. Um, I've remapped, you know, I've let the player remap certain key codes to be other key codes, right? Because usually you kind of in games, you're able to change your controls to be whatever they, whatever you want them to be. And then I've just serialized, you know, the tab key as like the number nine. That's not going to be compatible with 258, right? Which is what it is right now through Jill at W. They can, th those key codes are going to be different. So Again, hypothetically speaking, I copy and paste my key code, like save file or whatever, let's just say like my input, like preferences. I copy and paste that file from my Windows computer to my Mac computer and run Hazel on that. That's not gonna work, right? It's not gonna know what the tab key is because you've serialized it, you've serialized it as a number and that's what it expects it to be. Now you could solve this by just serializing a string which says tab or something like that. And then at, when, it, when it deserializes it, it could look up the actual value and then you'd be kind of set there. Um, but again, that's something that you just have to do because if you kind of at runtime, if you've hard coded your keys to be a certain code that is like either the GLW one or the Windows one, you have to kind of stick with that the whole way through. And that's kind of the downside of that. The other thing you could do is have a function, and this is quite common as well, to have a function that actually converts between the key codes as necessary, right? Just a lookup table, essentially. So for example, HZ key four is that value, sure. But when you interact with GLW, for example, in Windows window, when we actually do, you know, the key callback, right? And we have to um, do a key rest event with this key, you do a conversion. So you do something like GLW, 
key to hz key, right? Little function, which might just be a lookup table into a map or something like that, which just converts this glfw key code into the correct hazel key code. And that's the one that you pass into that event, right? Um, and then that's obviously for events. And then for polling, which is this thing, when you get the key code here before you pass it into here, you just do hz key code to glfw key code, right? And then you do that conversion here and that's it. Now that does mean that every time you do a key press or anything like that, you do have to do a lookup into a map. Uh, in my experience, that's fine. Like I don't, like I've never ever in the history of my life seen like a bottleneck of a game engine be, oh, it's because I'm doing lookups for key codes, right? Um, a lot of people I think like to um, do a lot of optimizations that's completely unnecessary in certain areas where they think that they can save like a few CPU cycles, whereas in other areas where it's much more important and much more kind of damaging to not do optimization, they seem to overlook that because it's just too complicated or people don't think about it in that sense. So um, I think that's an, that's an optimization that like, I think the performance difference between just compiling with the correct key codes in the first place versus having, having a lookup table that you need to look up every time you press a key I th that's negligible, right? There's no difference there as far as I'm concerned, so I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, based on those two methods, I think what I probably would do is still always have Hazel key codes as a constant that is always the case at runtime, and then when you interact with different libraries which require different key codes, that's when you can actually do what you need to do. Now, and, 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 by, and by that I just mean convert it into, into the right actual key code. Now, one thing I will say though is that um, we know that these are GLFW key codes, right? So the function that, you know, if we're in Windows window and we're in GLFW set key callback and we need to do this, we actually know that no conversion is necessary because we're using the right ones. So you would only need to do this conversion for when you interact with libraries other than GLFW. And again, if we had just made up random key codes or something like that for, um, for all these values, then we would need to do a conversion every time. Now these aren't completely random, like these, like A being 65, that lines up with ASCII codes, right? So that's quite useful um, because you can basically grab this HZ key F and just convert it into a char and then suddenly you can actually print that character to the console by just printing HZ key F, right? So what I mean by that is, um, you know, okay, when we have a this on event thing, right? So let's just get a... Um, you know, instead of tracing this or whatever, I'll say uh, if the event uh, type is a key event, a key pressed event, I wish that it would actually show me uh, what I wanted, key pressed event, um, then we can get the uh, key event, oops, it's a key pressed event, um, and we'll just cast this into the right type. All right, um, and then we'll just do e get key code. What I can actually do is log that. So we'll say hz trace, um, and I'll put this in here. Uh, except what I'll do is I'll actually cast it to a char, okay? So if I try and log something like this, you'll see that for values that are like stupid, like control or shift or whatever, it might be stupid, but if we actually um, press, you know, A, you know, SD, you know, if I type in the word public, public static, I was going to write. Um, but you can see if I type that word in, like you can actually see what the letters are by just casting this to a char because the key code that we're using actually lines up with ASCII codes. So they're not completely random and that's why making your own random ones will be weird. But obviously with things like tab and I think that they, I'm not sure why they chose them to be what they are. Like for example, why tab is 258. I don't know the backstory behind that. Um, but you know, certain ones like letters, you do want to actually line up with ASCII characters just because uh, you have kind of those benefits there. But anyway, that's kind of the gist of it. I mean, there's nothing really here um, to be too concerned about. I'll leave this code in here and I'll commit it into the repository for uh, this video. But um, yeah, you can see that now we have the ability to do polling via that. And we also have the ability to actually do um, uh, events kind of stuff events, I guess, key events. Um, and then we can, we have the correct key codes that we can actually just print to the console. And now we have 
like this is the big thing. Um, obviously with this as well, you could do comparisons now. So if e.getKeyCode is equal to tab, um, then you could also do tab keys press, for example. And then that would be instead of kind of polling it and checking it every time, you can just handle it when it actually gets pressed. But the point is we can now do this comparison. So I'll do event here. Um, uh, poll. Okay. Um, and we can actually see the difference here as well. Uh, but you can now kind of do both of these things that weren't possible before without including glfw. So there we go. We have, um, obviously the ASCII character for tab is not there, but we have the poll and we have the event. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we have the ability now to do these kind of comparisons with certain key codes and as well as like ask what key is pressed without actually including glfw at all. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and that's again, gonna be really important for when we actually need to use these features. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. You can help support the series by going over to patreon.com forward slash the churno. Huge thank you as always to all the lovely patrons there. Uh, for supporting, you'll get videos a week early as well as access to the Hazel development branch source code, um, which is actually getting quite exciting now because I've just started on the renderer and like the render command queues and like, it's going to be all kind of, it's multi-threaded and everything. So it's, things are heating up there. I can't wait to actually start working on this stuff in the videos, but we do still have quite a long way to go until we get up to like the exciting stuff that is on that development branch. So if you want a sneak peek, definitely check that out. Now, in terms of what we're doing next, we have a lot of options, a lot of juicy options because we're at the point now where we have kind of events, input, application, layer stack, that kind of stuff done. Um, those are kind of the base features that you really need to build it, build up as well as logging and I'm GUI as well, I really like to have. Um, there are some I'm GUI things that I wanna do eventually. Uh, the Hazel development branch at the moment has a version of I'm GUI which supports uh, both docking, so you can actually dock things kind of like you can in Visual Studio, um, as well as drag windows outside of your window. So you can place windows outside of the window. It'll just kind of create a new window behind the scenes. It's really cool. Um, I want to integrate that into Hazel eventually. I might not do that next episode because it feels like we're kind of going around in circles and iterating so much on what we've got instead of introducing new features. I know you guys are excited to see some of those new features. So why don't you leave a comment below as to what you actually want to see next in Hazel. At the moment, I think what I'm going to do, like we have a few options. So we could just like go continue going the kind of back end like let's just build stuff up that we need um, in the background without actually seeing stuff on the screen, uh, kind of that route and actually do um, uh, serialization because that needs to be done at some point. But a much more exciting topic, which we might want to do is rendering, right? And graphics and that kind of stuff. Um, but there's also like, there's so much stuff we can do. We can go scripting languages and kind of take a look at those. I don't actually even know what I want to use. Might be Lua, might be Python, might be something like that. Um, not sure. There's so much stuff that we can actually do. We can start designing tools, um, like a 3d model format, like a level editor and I'm GUI. There's so much stuff that we can do. So just leave a comment below as to what you want to see, um, and what you think sounds exciting. A lot of the reasons why I want to make a renderer is probably because it will look nice and then Hazel will look nice and then the thumbnails will look nice. And then anyway, it would kind of just be good because you have kind of something to show. Cause unfortunately when people look at a game engine, they see kind of superficially like what's there, like okay, this is what it looks like. Therefore, I know how good it is based on what, it's look, what it looks like. Obviously that's rubbish, but that's kind of how people work. So I kind of maybe want to go that, that, that kind of route. But if you guys have any suggestions, I just want to kind of basically do what you guys want to, I want to give you guys what you want to see. So leave a comment below and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.